right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Gabrowski, and I'll be your host for today. We're really excited for today's event. We always love uh, these opportunities to connect with the crew from Hearts in the Ice, who are on just an amazing uh, mission, an amazing uh, expedition in Svalbard. So uh, in 2019-2020, Sunvis Orbi and Hilda Strom made history when they became the first women to overwinter in Svalbard solo. They spent 12 months at the remote trapper's cabin called Bumsabu, located at 78 degrees north and 140 kilometers from the nearest town of Longyearbyen in Svalbard. So climate change is not taking a break, so neither are they. They returned to Svalbard in November and will be overwintering at Bumsabu until May of 2021. So together with a team of 10 global partners, Hearts in the Ice is a bridge between science and global citizens to better understand climate change and why we all need to be doing our part. So they will continue to serve as citizen scientists on a variety of projects, from observing clouds and auroras to flying drones to monitor ice and collecting phytoplankton samples as they build on their second year of data collection. So we're really excited to have them joining live via satellite phone right now from Bumsabu. Hilda and Sunova, how are you doing today? Hey, everybody, we're doing great, thank you. All right, well, it's great to have you joining in live with us. I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit and get us caught up. I'm also gonna share my screen because we have a couple uh, cool images that you shared with me as well. Yes, that's great. So uh, this is Hilda and Sinova, and um, we're now up uh, at this remote cabin as uh, Joe just told you about. It's actually close to the North Pole. And up here we can see that the climate change has a great impact. Last winter when, when we were here, it was more sort of a normal winter, but this winter we see how things are changing. We've had rain this winter, and that is not good news for the reindeer because the tundra is covered by ice. It's like a skating area, the whole area down here. And it's so mild, so we don't have any ice. And the polar bears, as you know, they need ice in order to get to their food source, which is steel. So um, we um, we actually are outside here doing uh, stuff for uh, the scientists. We are collecting data, and we walk uh, around this house even though it's absolutely, completely pitch black outside. It's not, we don't see anything. But we actually have a little equipment with us. It's a night vision scope with the infrared um, uh, sort of a, a thing that we can see in the dark. So I don't know, Joe, maybe you can show the picture of Sunira and the two reindeers, the black and white picture. And that those two reindeers are actually quite close to Sunira. But it wouldn't be impossible for us to see it with our headlamps or without without this uh, this scope. So that is two polar, uh, two reindeers that are trying to find their food through a layer of ice. So it's kind of dramatic to to see. And last winter we had uh, a youth polar bear coming into the house or into this area and had a close encounter with our dog Etta just outside here. And it, it was a huge polar bear, and I think it's more than 600 kilos. And when we're talking about they, it's the scientists and people like Polar Bear International that's on the call here. They have track of many of the polar bears in, in our area. So maybe you can show uh, also the picture of the two polar bears that we um, saw through our uh, scope. Uh, and that's four days ago. So they are close by, but we usually don't see them. Um, and we haven't had anyone up on our doorstep yet. But it's, it's dark, you know, and uh, what are we doing when it's uh, so mild and so different? Hey, everybody, just a quick little update from uh, over here. Thanks, Hilda. Um, and we are sitting like side by side on this couch in this tiny 20 square meter trapper's cabin. Um, and it is mild, as she said, outside. But I don't know if all of you can relate uh, being tucked away in small places with all this isolation um, that we're all having to, to go through with COVID. 
um, we recently said yes to a team of three psychologists that actually wanted to study probably how crazy we are. Uh, like, why are you going back there for a second year? Um, but also study our isolation and coping. Like, how do we live in such a small place, just the two of us? So that's a new thing for us this year. And because we have an open fjord out there, guess what we did the other day? And Joe, I think I sent you a picture of this with our kayaks. We pulled out um, older kayaks and we took we put some Christmas lights around because there's nothing to see out there except black. And I don't know, I have a little bit of a fear of the dark on the being of the water. Uh, but we collect them. It's a very interesting thing to do in the pool at night because they're not sure if the phytoplankton bloom without sunlight. So we've been doing that. We also have flown our drone uh, on its pre-programmed flights. And we, um, we've we also, because there is so much um, sort of open sea here, it brings with it in the surf tons of garbage, um, plastic bottles, um, netting. We have a picture of us pulling up some netting too and just lots of plastic. So we've been collecting that uh, in addition to the drone and the phytoplankton. And then of course, photography with the Aurora. We had an amazing uh, Northern night display last night um, up here. And, and I'll just answer a quick, quick question that somebody asked a little bit ago. Why in the world is it so dark up here 24 seven? And for many of you on the call right now, I'm sure you know what darkness is, but you probably get the sunrise and the sunset every day. And we don't appear until February. So from November to February, the sun is actually below six degrees um, or six degrees below the horizon, and it doesn't actually come up this far north. So we're in um, what they call the polar night, which is why headlamps, spotting scopes, and safety gear like our flare gun and things like that are super important when we're out there uh, with the polar bears in this world. And just to hand it over now to Polar Bears International, and we are so grateful to Canada Goose for hosting um, this month. And for for you, Joe, you are just our resident rock star, and you look great having shaved your um, mustache. I saw you before. And um, the team... Um, um, you know, KT and Joanne and BJ from Polar Bears International. Thank you guys so much. All right. Good stuff. Well, thank you for that great update. And yes, November did come to an end. So uh, the mustache is gone. Uh, but it's great to be catching up. And I'm really excited now uh, to introduce our experts who are joining us from Polar Bears International. So let me bring them in here quickly. There we go. All right, good stuff. And we wanna make sure we do a little spotlight action there. There we go. So today joining us, uh, we've got tech guru, uh, BJ Krishoffer joining us. So he ensures the smooth working of Polar Bear International's field operations from maternal den studies in Svalbard and Alaska to live Tundra connection webcasts, which links scientists in the field with people all over the world. And we're also excited to be joined by uh, Joanna Sulik today. So she is a biologist with the Norwegian Polar Institute and works on the Polar Bear Denning Project uh, with Polar Bear International. And I do wanna give a special shout out to Katie Miller, who's providing us with uh, the amazing photo and video action behind the scenes. Uh, so BJ and Joanne, it's so great to have you joining us live today. I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit uh, and then we'll get to some Q&A action with everybody. Well, it's nice to be here with you mm -hmm. and all the classrooms. And it's also nice to be here with Hilda and Sinova. Um, it's so exciting to be able to speak with you, uh, especially, since you're in such a remote location, we want to do we want to give a quick shout out to Canada Goose uh, for sponsoring this month as well. They're a big uh, sponsor of our organization too, and really help us uh, conduct our work both on the education front and on the research front. So um, they're a fantastic company. Um, our mission statement at Polar Bears International is to conserve polar bears and the sea ice they depend on. And that's really kind of the most important takeaway. If you were to learn one thing today, it's that polar bears need sea ice to survive. And you got a great picture of one right here, um, walking around on some sea ice. Uh, you know, maybe this wouldn't be quite prime polar bear habitat. There's a lot of open water there. This might be a little better polar bear habitat, but this is what they need to survive. A lot of pictures do show polar bears on land and maybe potentially Hilda and Seneva will see polar bears 
on land, um, but that's not really where they want to be. They want to be on the sea ice where they can catch their food, they can meet their mates, and they can raise their young. So we'll be coming back to some of that here later on. Um, but, <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> but uh, but we're really happy to be connecting with you today. And I want to uh, let Joanna take over a little bit. Joanna, if I can say, we met her uh, several years ago as she was a student of Jan Arsch over at the Norwegian Polar Institute working on her master's thesis. And uh, she came on on our maternal den study project, which we'll be talking about today. And, uh, and she has been an absolute pleasure to work with an expert in the field. And since then, she's worked not only in the far north, but also in the far south in Antarctica with MP. So we're super lucky to have her. And, uh, and Joanna, take it away. Hi, thanks, BJ. Um, I'm very excited to, to be here today and to talk to you about um, the study that we are uh, conducting in Svalbard. And um, it's also very exciting to be with Suniva and Hilda, who are there at the moment, and they are experiencing the darkness of the polar night. So you can imagine that for polar bears, like it also is a challenging time. So we can only admire polar bears even more when we hear about the difficulties of experiencing a full year in Svalbard. So the, the admiration for, for the adaptations of polar bears is even greater when we can really um, hear the, the experiences of people who are out there. But um, maybe I should tell you a little bit about what polar bears are doing uh, at the moment right now. Well, um, so Svalbard, as you can see here on the map, it's a, it's a very important habitat for polar bears. So it's located in the Arctic Circle, far, far up north when the sea ice is reaching. So as BJ was saying, polar bears depend on sea ice and um, they need sea ice to hunt seals. And Svalbard was a um, perfect environment for that. His, uh, for a lot of time, it had a lot of sea ice, a lot of seals. Uh, other animals were roaming around, so polar bears could eat walrus, uh, they could eat some white whales or narwhals, or occasionally feast on dead whale carcass that was uh, washing ashore. And uh, the bears don't really need to hibernate, they just go around and get their food, but Polar bear moms, on the other hand, they really need to go into a den. So they dig a warm maternity den um, in the snow in the late autumn. And somewhere around time right now, they are giving birth to, like on average, two very small cubs. And they remain uh, together in that den for, uh, for a long period, all the way until spring. And they emerge from those dens and... March and April. Um, yeah, so Svalbard is uh, uh, an important place for polar bears. It's also a very important place for moms and cubs. And we are trying to um, look into what they are actually doing when they're out there. So in Svalbard, as Sriva and Hilda mentioned, it can be very uh, dry and there is, is a little bit, a little snow. So uh, polar bears need places where snow accumulates. So uh, if the snow is uh, falling on land and then it's carried with wind, if it's stopped by mountains, it creates the um, um, blown areas where the snow accumulates and remains throughout the year. And those places are uh, hard to find out on the sea ice, but when it's on land and there's on mountains like here in Svalbard, Polar bears really depend on, on those mountain chains to, to find suitable snow patches and dig a den and, and, uh, and get there in the hilly terrain to, to dig their den. Um, yeah, <laughs> I can, um, uh, I don't know, BJ, why, um, um, why, why, I can ask you, why did you uh, choose, I know that the, the study that we, I'm taking part of now, was um, um, happening in uh, North America beforehand, but um, why did you choose Svalbard to expand the study? That's a, you know, that's a really good question. Um, I think I think before we dive into why Svalbard, I think we can tie this a little bit into Hilda and Sinova in that in order to uh, really understand a species, you have to you have to watch it. 
Um, and there's a lot of different ways you can do it. I mean, Hilda and Sinova are out there in the environment uh, being witnesses to what's happening uh, in the far north. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, how would we know? Uh, how can we talk about it? How can we communicate that there's no sea ice um, if there aren't people studying it, if there aren't people watching it? So I think that's, I think that's super important. And I think it kind of transfers over to the DEN project as well. How do we know what's happening with polar bears? Well, we have to watch them somehow. This project started, like Joanna says, over in North America, in Northern Alaska. It's a place that's very, very different than Svalbard. Uh, Northern Alaska is like someone took a giant iron and flattened the entire landscape. It's a very, very cold place, uh, typically, or it used to be in the wintertime. Um, and you, the place is so flat, when you're riding a snowmobile, you can't even tell when you've moved from the land onto the frozen, frozen ocean. It is just one big, white, flat plain. It is unbelievable how flat it is there. And so finding dens there is so difficult. Um, the polar bears like to den in something uh, even as small as a, a bluff that's behind something that's two meters tall. It is so subtle. Um, and um, what, I've ha what I've happening is that we started to run out of dens to look at um, because of a mix of um, troubles with putting out radio collars on the polar bear dens because of um, climate change and funding, um, we just had less and less bears that we could study. So we started to reach out to some of our partners and Norwegian Polar Institute said, yeah, we could work together on this. Um, and so with the San Diego Zoo involved, Megan Owen, Dr. Megan Owen, um, we moved to Svalbard. And as you saw there, um, there's huge mountains in Svalbard. This, this is the environment that Hilda and Sinova are in. And so we had to learn a lot. This is one of our early systems um, in Svalbard and oh man, it was, it's too big, <laughs> you know, to move this around mountain next to Paul, where in Alaska, it's no problem because there wasn't even a hill to really contend with. So, um, yeah, so, uh, so that's why we moved it is because we really kind of had to, we needed to have bears study and the Norwegian Polar Institute has a very, very good program of putting radio collars onto bears and studying bears. And so we were able to uh, work with them uh, to not only use uh, you know, their expertise and their people, but uh, work with their people, but also work with the bears that they study. So um, yeah, maybe you know, we could talk a little bit about what it actually takes to put this equipment out there. Um, sure. Now that we've uh, worked together so long, what is it like to, to prepare for a departure for a, um, in, you know, instrumenting a polar bear den. What, what do we do? Oh, the, like, as you said, um, um, it's, it's very difficult to find a polar bear. So I would say that the job of uh, finding a den starts in spring. When Jon Orsch, uh, together with M Magnus from uh, um, Norwegian Polar Institute, they venture each spring out in the sea ice to find polar bears to trap them, to and then do all the necessary measurements and, um, and fit them with the telemetry collars. And telemetry collars work a little bit like our cell phones, so they are programmed to collect and then send the position of a bear together with other measurements, uh, and they send it to to the scientist uh, directly. So since spring. The, we know that there are bears out there in the ice and we know exactly where they are. So when the time, um, uh, so um, when the time comes and next uh, autumn and winter, we can start really mapping the, the dens that we see the polar bears go into. And then we, we can start um, together with uh, collecting the equipment and programming the cameras. We can start uh, putting a plan together. and. Um, BJ showed you a picture earlier of a big white bear proof box which uh, held the camera inside and since then the technology um, uh, that BJ is working on changed a lot. So we're now working with, um, with cameras that fit into much smaller bear proof boxes or at least we're hoping they're bear proof. Here you can see uh, BJ and myself uh, checking a, a final settings before we leave the camera open, uh, record, no, oh, like camera will be closed, but it will be on and recording a bear, a bear den that we found. 
So yes, we are finding the bears, we are programming the cameras, we are fitting them in boxes, we are preparing all of the equipment uh, ahead of time in a warmth of a nice shelter. We are running a, a test beforehand and then we're all ready. We go out with snow scooters or helicopters and we ski to the closeness of the den. We try to be as quiet as possible and as fast as possible. We leave our equipment uh, when we all, uh, all that we practice setting up and then we uh, make sure that everything's working and leave the place as fast as possible because the last thing we want to do is to bother bears on uh, when we try to uh, see you know they're in the most vulnerable time of their life uh, in the polar bear den. Yeah, I think that's uh, a good description. You know, it's a lot of uh, preparations and a lot of checklists. Um, a lot of practicing to make sure we can work together as a team, as an effective team, um, so that we can, when we get to the site, we can work quickly so we don't disturb the bears and then we get out of there as, as soon as possible. Um, so it is a lot of uh, preparations. And then it seems like uh, it takes about five hours for us to be dropped off, find the den actually in the snow and set everything up and ski away. Uh, the five hours goes by in just a blink of an eye. It, it is, I mean, it feels like 30 minutes. It goes by so quick. Um, everybody's working so hard and, and so quickly. So um, yeah, it is, is, it's a pretty amazing thing. And I think actually, one thing we want to share with you today is what the cameras see. So this is, this is really the key to the whole, whole thing here. We're, if you look here, this is a time-lapse video of one of the bears in Svalbard. And you can see the tracks building. It's very small and it moves really quickly. Um, but this is a polar bear that came out of her den. She didn't bring her cubs with on the first time. Uh, but then she, you know, she's probably just trying to get away from her kids for a little while. I mean, hard to say, but, you know, she's just been in a snow hole for like, you know, maybe two and a half months, two months with her kids. And she's like, I need to get out of here for a minute. So you can see that she's made some tracks. Maybe she's dug another little den here. Um, almost like a day bed. She's probably spending a lot of time rolling around. We also know they spend a lot of time looking. Now that she's revealed where she is, she's making tracks and she's open her den, she spends a lot of time looking for danger because really the most dangerous thing to polar bears is other polar bears. So these are the things that we're actually interested in. Um, the whole reason for setting these cameras up is to help us describe what do they do at the den site? How many cubs do they have? How big are the cubs? How, how much time do they spend in the de at the den site? All those sorts of things. And it seems kind of basic, but you know, if nobody's there to watch, how do we know what normal is? How do we know what, what things should be like? And how can we tell what a change is? So maybe Joanna, uh, I hope I'm not springing this question on you, on you here, but why is this project important for, for bear conservation? Can you help us maybe a bit sure, on that? Sure, sure. So I think we've touched on it briefly beforehand, how different the environment in Svalbard is uh, from, let's say, Hudson Bay. So polar bears are a, a species that live all across the Arctic. And as we know, they depend on sea ice, but sea ice conditions throughout around the world, they change uh, from area to area. And Svalbard is a place where the sea ice loss is almost as twice as fast as in other places uh, where polar bears live. So it, the, the environment in Svalbard changes dramatically and dramatically fast as well. So looking at polar bear uh, denning in Svalbard and looking at how moms and cubs really cope with those changes at the moment can help us understand in general the the, the the challenges that the polar bear species faces in the future. So having a good understanding of polar bear ecology throughout their range around the world is really crucial if we want to understand what is necess ne like absolutely necessary um, for, for effective conservation of the species. So the better we understand the bears, the better we know how they're doing out there, especially in such important time when they're giving birth and raising their kids, the better we can protect them. Uh, I think that's perfect. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um, you really do have to understand something 
if you want to know how to take care of it and how to protect it. So, yeah, and I think the future of this project is really to try to continue on. We consider this project long-term monitoring. And really for us to see changes, we need to look over a long period of time. Uh, I think this year will be, um, I think it's our fifth or sixth year. Um, we're hoping for maybe 10 or more. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so to continue on the same work, also continue innovating. You know, like Ioana says, we made, we built the cameras, we're building cameras in order to do this work because we didn't find anything off the shelf that was, uh, you know, fit the needs that we had. So I think we'll continue looking at better ways and less invasive ways. Uh, so, you know, easier ways to get data without disturbing the bears. Um, and I think that's important to us. So, yeah. Uh, we're looking forward to more time in the cold with frozen fingers. It's, um, B just said, it's going to be five hours uh, out there in the field, but I'm telling you this, we are so engaged in the whole uh, thing that we are starting to feel the cold, like by the very end when we're waiting for a pickup. It's, uh, um, it's very exciting. And then each year is bringing so much more information and more innovation that can be used not only for polar bear science, but using other animals. So it's really the work that's being done here. I think it's taking um, research on animals and observation research in a great, exciting new direction. Hmm. All right. Very cool. Joanna and BJ, thank you so much for sharing the, uh, you know, that amazing work that you're doing. The, the the footage looks incredible it's funny to watch it kind of sped up and see the tracks in the snow uh we did have a quick question i want to slide in on youtube are you once the cameras are in place can do you have any control over them at, at all or are they pretty kind of locked in place that's a really good question and you know i think in an ideal world we would have control or potentially maybe in the future they'll control themselves maybe we'll use some motion detection and some um, some AI built in to help it motor itself. We aren't there yet. The place, Svalbard is so far north. It's actually pretty amazing that Hilda and Cinevar are, are able to get a telephone connection out. I mean, to have streaming internet to make your camera work and see what it's doing is is very difficult and also very, very expensive. So, um, so no, we can't control them yet, but our goal is to potentially in the future make the cameras so they can control themselves. Fingers crossed. All right, very cool. Well, what do you say? Let's meet some classrooms and get a little Q&A action going. Let's do it. All right. Very cool. Um, so I do, oops, let's fix that there. There we go. I do have Hilda and Sunova uh, still uh, with us via satellite phone. So Hilda and Sunova, maybe just uh, before we jump into a little Q&A action, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, we saw some great pictures last year where you, you saw the big prints out in the snow. Uh, and I know you had more than kind of a dozen visitors at different time. What, what's that like to be in the cabin, such a, such a small cabin, so remote, and have those big visitors coming to your door? Yeah, great question. Um, my first, uh, this is Geneva, and uh, he has been living up here for 25 years, so she's seen her fill of polar bears, um, and my first uh, polar bear up here was in August when we were actually uh, getting all our supplies organized for our official um, stay here in September. And he was uh, the largest bear in the area, uh, around 600 kilos, but he was just walking up the hill and then went over the hill, and that was it. That was August. And then fast forward to October, um, a polar bear was uh, right on the side of the hut, and I turned on, we have satellite, we have um solar panel and, and windmill here for, for power, and I turned on the light outside to go and close our wooden shutters. Oh, we just lost them. So we may lose them from time to time. The satellite connection, like PJ mentioned, it's not easy to connect uh, from somewhere so far north. The curvature of the earth definitely doesn't help. Uh, so we're going to start grabbing some questions, and I'm sure they're going to call back within a moment, uh, and we'll continue our discussion. Uh, I do want to say we've got classrooms joining us across Canada. So uh, I see some classrooms are already shouted out from British Columbia, uh, from Alberta and Ontario. I see some classrooms in the U.S. and Colorado, Arizona and New York. We even have groups uh, in the chat. I can see Germany and India. So it's great to have such a, a wow. diverse group Super kind cool. of uh, in here with us. So I think, Hilda and Sinova, we got you back. 
good luck, and um, I'm not sure where I got cut off there, but I was just, uh, can you, maybe you can tell me. Yeah, absolutely. You were, had just, you would just flick the light on when you had your visitor. <laughs> okay, keeping you all in su suspense. <laughs> um, I turned the light to go outside and close the shutters, and he appeared right to my right and was literally no more than two meters feet away. And I tell you, I we both love, um, they're magnificent marine mammals. Um, they are beautiful. They deserve our love and attention and protection. And when you're that close to them, you can't help but have your heart in your throat in that very moment. It was really close. We've had uh, over 53 polar bear encounters this last winter, including uh, being able to spot one that the Norwegian Polar Institute is tracking, N26131. Uh, she's been given a name because she had a caller. And can I, can we just tell you what a privilege it was for us to spot her with a newborn in April? Um, so she wow. April, December, she would have been about 15 kilos um, and uh, not, not, not just four months. And then um, to our surprise, we see the fa same female coming uh, here at Bumsabu, showing up on Hinda's birthday, July 13th, and um, she had just come out of the water, and sadly, she was without cubs. So we've seen high highs and high lows and just how precious and privileged these moments of observation are. And I'll pass it to Hinda. She had something to share about some conditions up here. Yeah, no, it's it's really changing, and and I have, as Sunva said, been here for twenty five years, and and been down to this hut so many times, and seen a lot of polar bears, and have close encounters. But um, it's also a good thing to see that um, those that we have seen have have seen quite um, in, in okay conditions. We see that they still uh, come with with cubs, and some of them survive. We had this one huge polar bear on our doorstep in November last year. It's uh, the same one as Sunima mentioned. It's uh, as, uh, according to Yul Norsh, it's probably more than 600 kilos, which is uh, approximately as big as this hut. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's 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 huge, and um, we are of course now very worried about conditions for the ice. We are worried about. We have a lot of or we have some snow and hopefully the female polar bears in the area that are going to give birth uh, do find an area where they can dig a den and we know of a place um, not so far away from this, this hut that um, that is a regular spot for a den and we we don't we're not scientists so we keep our distance way way far from that but hopefully you know and and people from Polar Bear International will find out that we have more polar bears um, giving birth in this area this coming winter, or now, soon actually, in a few weeks hmm. from now. All right, good stuff. That sounds exciting. Um, okay, well, let's start bringing some classrooms in. First, I want to give a shout out. We've got uh, a crew joining us from Kamloops, um, and they are uh, third graders. Their camera's not cooperating, but they're here in the call. So. Uh, they're going to send this uh, a few questions via the chat, so I'm going to keep my eye out for those. Let's go to some fourth graders in Glenview, Illinois, with Miss Michael. I'm going to bring Miss Michael into the call here. Hey, Miss Michael, how you doing? Hi, I have Emma who has a question for you. Emma, speak loudly so they can hear you. My class is. How Julian. long is the average life of a polar bear? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, so. You know, a uh, polar bear, we like to say polar bears in zoos and aquariums. They have a really good uh, healthcare program. They've got z uh, vets looking after them. The longest polar bear known to have lived was Debbie in the Winnipeg Zoo up in Canada, in Manitoba. And she lived to be 42 years old. That's a pretty old bear. Um, but in the wild, they don't live quite as long. The females live a little bit longer than the males. They have a pretty hard life. They have to fight for their girlfriends. Um, so females can live uh, into their late 20s pretty easily. And then the males in kind of their mid to early 20s. All right, great question to kick things off. Uh, let's jump to another classroom now. This time, let's come back to Canada. Uh, Miss Holden's crew is in Spruce Grove, uh, Alberta. Let's bring them in live. There we go. Hey, Mrs. Holden. Hi there. 
we are wondering, are there different kinds of polar bears or are they all the same? Ah, that is a good question. And I think it's something that's been asked over and over since the polar bears live um, all around. They live in Svalbard, they live in Siberia, they live in Alaska and Northern Canada and in Greenland. And although they are divided in different subpopulations around the world, they all tend to be pretty similar. And that is because polar bears live in similar conditions all across the Arctic. And they're also uh, facing similar challenges all throughout. So um, they are polar bears uh, that are um, part of different subpopulations due to um, the place in which they live. And they do um, live in different conditions. So that's very flat in Hudson Bay and very mountainous in, in Svalbard. There's a little more ice in uh, some areas and it's uh, melting faster in others, but it's all polar bear. It's the same species all throughout. All right, I'm gonna switch over to YouTube here. We've got so many, so huge shout out to all the groups on YouTube. We've got lots of questions coming in, a great discussion. Um, Mrs. Clark has Cassie in her class and they're wondering about polar bear swimming. Uh, how great of a distance can they cover? And are they able to actually dive down and hold their breath a little bit? Oh man, those are great questions. Yeah, they're fantastic. Yeah, uh, Joanna, do you know, uh, do you know how deep they can swim? Yes, so um, the polar bears, they can swim for hundreds of kilometers and it is um, a very, uh, you know, it, it's harder for them to swim than it is to walk. So they do use a lot of energy when swimming, but they do carry a lot of energy uh, on them if the conditions are right. So they can really swim for hundreds of kilometers. And these are some of the ways that polar bears, um, you know, the, the result to, in order to go far distances and go from one ice patch to another. But uh, another thing is that they use their very, agile hunters and they um, at, like approach every hunting uh, situations uh, differently and in a unique way using the best of their opportunities. So the callers that I was talking about earlier, they managed to record the depth of diving as well. So the polar bear uh, is usually swimming on the surface and you know comfortably moving along with its strong paws, but from time to time it can dive really deep and what um, and scientists recorded that it's over almost, almost uh, over 10 meter uh, deep dive and um, that is believed to um, to do with the way the polar bear is hunting. So uh, if that was a, a ice float on which a seal would be resting, a polar bear can do a, a neat move where they can um, let's imagine that the seal is facing uh, away from me, polar bear can come and dive underwater away from the seal, go all the way down and use this buoyancy that it has to just plop out of the water right in front of the seal and grab it. So they usually swim on the surface and they can do it for many kilometers, but they do occasionally really dive, dive deep down and use it to get the momentum and grab the seal. All right, very, very cool. Uh, and a great question from uh, YouTube. Uh, let's take a little trip to British Columbia. Look at this crew we got hanging out with us Whoa. Uh, in Kelowna. Hi. Hey, everybody. Hi. Let's get that mic unmuted so we can say hi. Hello. There they are. Hey, boys and girls. Okay, Luke, what's your question? How, why is this? Oh, we Ooh. lost. Say it again. Why guys? He wants to know why the sea ice is disappearing. Perfect. Oh, wow. That is a really good question. So, you know, sea ice is disappearing because of uh, emissions, uh, greenhouse gases that people are emitting uh, in our everyday lives. And uh, and really, it's, you know, it's it things from airplanes that fly to the cars that drive to some places where um, the energy is produced using coal um, or other things that are burnt, um, these gases are emitted and build almost like a, a blanket 
uh, over the atmosphere, over the earth. It's this invisible blanket up there. And um, we need a little bit of blanket to keep the earth warm, but the blanket is getting thicker than we need. And so the earth is getting warmer and the ice is melting because of that. That's a very good question. Yeah, and uh, Hilda and Sinova, um, you know, you're kind of seeing a little bit of that firsthand with the warmer temperatures you're experiencing right now. Yeah, we absolutely are. And it's interesting, um, to your point, BJ, w with uh, white, it reflects the sunlight back into the atmosphere naturally. And without um, ice, it's actually the oceans are absorbing a lot of that heat, which just has this really negative impact on our entire ecosystem. And right now, um, December 10th, and there is no ice in the fjords. Um, that was very different from last year. Last year was a big sea ice year, but this year is more a reflection of the trend of uh, diminishing sea ice. Yeah, and I was just looking at the sea ice maps uh, for the Barents Sea, and it looks like the sea ice is a long ways away from Svalbard as well, um, which is uh, sad to see. Yeah, wow. Well. Oh yeah, it's a scary development, and um, mm. and um, well, we we need a we need a ice to come back. We need to do some. Uh, we need all to to be thoughtful users and do whatever we can in our own lives in order to prevent uh, this to escalate. We we need to get the temperature down and and the ice back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We have Mrs. Ross's fourth and fifth graders joining us in Ontario. I see someone nice enough front for us. How you doing, bud? Hi. So I have a question. Have you ever seen a, a polar bear that has has been hurt or something like that? Hurt. That's a good question. You know, um, when Joanna and I are in the field uh, working on the, the project that we just described, we don't see very many bears. In fact, if if we see a bear, we're maybe not doing something right. Other places in the Arctic um, where we've worked, we have on occasion seen evidence of bears being hurt in scar tissue, um, places where the skin is exposed. Um, but polar bears, believe it or not, a healthy polar bear uh, can heal pretty well. Um, they, Especially the males, they can lead a pretty tough life. Um, they do a lot of sparring is what we call it, uh, but it looks like wrestling, but they, of course they have really sharp teeth and claws and they fight pretty hard um, when it comes to mating season. Uh, but they also, like I say, a healthy polar bear can do pretty well at healing itself. So on occasion we, we do see, um, we do see hurt bears, but uh, it's more of evidence from being hurt in the past. I don't know if, Joanna, if you have other experience from your time in Svalbard. Yeah, there was actually this summer when I was on holidays and I was taking a long, long hike um, on the western side of Svalbard. I had seen a bear by the end of my trip that was uh, had a little wound on its snout. So uh, it was very recognizable. It was a bear that was not hurt badly. It, it had a scratch, a big scratch that was healing. But that scratch allowed me to later track this uh, bear through photos of friends or, or pe that people that I could uh, find that would spot the bear from from their boats and I could see um, a little bit of a history of that bear so that bear was also uh, captured by a automatic camera set by Norwegian Polar Institute and it was uh, also spotted eating eggs at bird cliffs so um, thanks to this little wound of the bear in a very recognizable place, or like very easily, um, uh, it was seen very easily, that bear became recognizable and I could track its, its uh, life history that summer a little bit. Okay, um, very cool. I'm going to jump to another question here. This is from grade threes in Kamloops. And so polar bears, you know, they're successful sometimes when they hunt, sometimes they're not. But in a you know an ideal world, they've got to they've got to catch. How much are they going to eat in a day? How much is a maybe a mother polar bear going to eat? Before we jump into the question, I just want to say that uh, Kamloops is the hometown of Elisa McCall, one of PBI's scientists. Um, she's a she's a fantastic communicator 
and a polar bear scientist. She's from Kamloops, so you have someone very famous from your town um, on the PBI staff. Uh, you should definitely check her out on our website. But yes, polar bears on average need to eat about one seal a week. But it's not that they get one seal every week. It's not like every Monday they get a seal. Um, polar bears kind of work almost like you could imagine your cell phone battery. It would be a really big battery. And when they can eat, they eat as much as they can. So they're kind of recharging that battery. And then when they don't find food, they sort of deplete that battery. And they go from really fat to skinnier and skinnier and skinnier. And then when they find the seals again, they fatten up again. So on average, they need over the course of a year about one ring seal per week. Um, but that might come in springtime and when they're on the sea ice. And then during the summertime, they may not eat for months at a time. In fact, the female polar bears can go through a fasting period that lasts up to eight months. Can you imagine not eating for eight months? If they're healthy enough, they can coast for this long in order to give birth to their cubs in that little den, come out and then go find seals again. And that could take up to eight months. So amazing animals. Absolutely, eight months, that's incredible. Um, let's see, we need to, we haven't been to miss a Metternich group. They are in Alberta. How are we doing today? Grade five? Good. Um, what will happen? What will happen if a polar bear meets another polar bear, specifically a male? That is a great question. And um, it depends, of course, when, uh, when the polar bears meet and if they want to meet each other or not. But um, when we talk about um, moms and cubs, we can think about of a female that she really wants to meet other bears only when she needs to find a dad of her cubs. And that is sometime in the spring when she's out in the sea ice. Then she, she is looking forward to see a male and meet a male um, and then mate with him. So she can become pregnant and then have cubs later. Uh, but when she has cubs already, um, and when she is going into the den or staying into the den, then she really does everything she can to stay away and steer away from those uh, from those males. Uh, because meeting one could be a very dangerous thing. They could uh, hurt uh, and kill the her cubs, or they could uh, hurt and kill her. So, um, so some some bad things could happen for her if she met a, a big hungry male. But um, so what she wants is to make sure that the environment in which she goes with her children is safe. And um, polar bear have amazing sense of smell. So and uh, quiet all right eyesight as well. So she's using really all the senses she can to, to scan her environment and to steer away from males for the time being. All right. Well, Helen Sinova, what? You know, what I love about uh, Hearts in the Ice is how you've pulled together just such a great crew uh, from all over the world uh, supporting uh, what's happening. So, you know, for instance, Canada Goose uh, making these events possible this month and obviously the great research with Polar Bear International. But this morning I got a chance to meet someone named Ellen Kvom and she uh, is an incredible designer in Norway who's teamed up with Hearts in the Ice to create some signature bracelets and necklaces to help Hilden Sunova's uh, you know, celebrate their mission through uh, the Hearts in the Ice project. So I'm going to share that little video now. And then Hilda and Sinova, if you just want to maybe touch just briefly on, on kind of how this came to be. Absolutely. And thanks. Um, this, um, everything we're doing up here is a labor of love. Um, both of us have experienced tremendous changes in the polar regions over the last 25 plus years. <laughs> Um, and so we're just like all of you on the call today, just wanting to make a little bit of a difference with our lives by pulling together experts like, uh, like you, Joe, and Polar Bears International and, and companies like Canada Goose and Marlink who are helping us with satellite technology to really just spread awareness. And then we meet somebody really special like Ellen Klum, who is in Oslo and is a, is a designer. And she created a very special, um, piece, a pendant. 
um, which is a symbol of community for our project, Hearts and Peace Pennant. And we just created a really cool, and we've only seen pictures, we haven't been able, we don't even have one yet, <laughs> um, a polar bear a bracelet because we're all living in a time of deep uh, separateness. And if anything, it's a real, it's a symbol of pulling us all together and creating an elevating conversation around not just all of us, but species that need us. So um, that's the little tea, and, and I'll let you all watch uh, what Ellen has to say. She's a beautiful lady. All right, here we go. Hi, all of you hearts in the ice enthusiasts. I am a jewelry designer, and I come from the far northern city of Tromsø. My jewelry is inspired by nature, the northern simplicity, and by colors of the north. Hildeström's interest in my jewelry is why the two of us met the first time near one of my pre-Christmas sales events almost two years ago. She was in a hurry and on her way to the airport in Svalbard. And as she passed me, she spotted my jewelry and she literally spun around and came over and introduced herself and her project, Heart in the Ice. Within minutes, I was on board and committed to design and produce the symbol necklace heartbeat. And I knew immediately what to make and how to do it. The heartbeat was well received from day one and have sold in large numbers to Hearts in the Eye supporters in all corners of the world. And also on board the Hutteruten ships, as Hutteruten are faithful supporters of the project as well. About six months after having met Hilde, I met Suniva Sörby uh, on board MS Nordstjernen on the trip that was to take the two women from the city Longyearbyen of Svalbard and into the wilderness and the trapper's hut Bamsebu. Many of us may have a hard time wrapping our heads around that concept of living like that. Uh, so these girls are heroes, no doubt. They were working hard and yet they found time to come up with a new idea. The project could benefit from having a signature bracelet. This time it was not an immediate solution as far as look and design is concerned because it was a few requirements that they had in mind for it that included, that introduced some challenges. It should be suitable for both men and women. Uh, only climate friendly materials, of course, include something to symbolize embracing the planet, include a polar bear. It is a very cute polar bear. Uh, if they needed it to include something blue, maybe a logo. Tall order. We made the embracelet in two versions for variety and we are excited about the results. I am grateful and honored to be included in the team of Heart in the Ice. It's only a joy to support these accomplished women by creating products that can help them raise funds to their important project of connecting people and for them to attend to their honest efforts and role in the conversation of climate change as citizen scientists. Thank you all for your kind attention and for letting me introduce the Heart in the Eyes in the Heart 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 and Heart in the Eyes brand in bracelets. Ladies and gentlemen, Ladies and gentlemen have, a great, have a great event. All right, very cool. Well, it was great to meet Ellen this morning and she's so uh, passionate about uh, being part of the Hearts in the Ice team uh, and sharing uh, that message. So it was great uh, to be able to share the work that she uh, has been doing. So uh, Hilden Cinema have joined us live in the call now. I see that buffering wheel, so maybe maybe it might not work out, but hopefully at the end, after another question or two, we're gonna try and turn their camera on uh, so they can say just a quick hi uh, before we go off uh, today. So we'll keep our fingers crossed that that works out for us. But uh, let's grab one or two more questions here from YouTube. Uh, one, this is from Mrs. Simmons uh, class. So Chris wants to know, uh, where is the, the biggest population of polar bears found today? Ooh, that is a good question. Oh, man. I want to say, actually, the Barents Sea population is one of the largest known uh, populations. God, it might have stumped me. Joanna, what do you got? <laughs> it's the same for me. It's... Um... 
the Barnsey population is very well counted. Uh, mm -hmm. So we know we have a good estimate of how many bears may live in Barnsey. But um, it's really hard to tell since uh, polar bears are very hard to study and they're even harder to count. Um, so BJ and I are both struggling to give a precise area and a precise uh, number in those places. But it's also due to the fact that they live in such remote places and such open areas. I think if I would add to that, uh, you know, so there's a few places where we know a lot about polar bears. Svalbard's one of them. Um, Alaska is one of them, uh, and Northern Canada is where we know a lot of, about polar bears because there's been long time research there's been people studying these bears for sometimes multiple decades, up to 40 years. Um, and Hudson Bay in Churchill, outside of Churchill, Manitoba is one of the best examples of that. Dr. Ian Sterling, uh, the Canadian scientist has studied for years and years and his students have studied and his students' students have studied. So, uh, so these are very important places, um, and that's where we—that's how we know how many bears are in these places. It's not because we go out every year and we just stand on a hill somewhere and we count twenty-five bears and say there's twenty-five bears. It takes a long time to go out and capture these bears over again. And uh, you, Joanna, you want to add something there? Yeah, I was thinking that if we were to cheat a little, we could say that you know the most polar bears are found sometimes around whale carcasses. They are mm. extraordinary pictures of bears uh, feasting on whale carcasses and resting around. So um, Jeff Yorick, who's also with Polar Bears International, he captured a photo with uh, oh, like hun over 100 polar bears. PJ, do you know what was precise number of all the bears around the whale carcass there? I don't actually, but lots and lots of bears. Yeah, I, lots of bears. <laughs> I am, I did, uh, I'm getting texts from from a friend actually from our scientists from Kamloops and uh, Baffin Bay and the Chukchi Sea and the Barents Sea all have the biggest uh, population. So we're talking the United States between US and Russia. We're talking Chukchi Sea, oh sorry, Baffin Bay is up in Canada and then Barents Sea of course is the Svalbard population. So um, there you go. Thank you, Elisa. Uh-oh, Joe. Oops, there we go. Good to be well connected with good polar bear friends. Oof, uh, no one more camera question. I can see someone in Mrs. Ross's four or fives who's been waiting nice and patiently. So we'll let you sneak another one in. How long, how long does it take for a polar bear to dig their den? That is a great question. That is a great question. So um, looking at the, um, so we mentioned earlier that polar bears wear the, those telemetry collars that have different devices installed in them. And that allows us to see um, a polar bear's movement as well, like if the bear is moving a lot or not. So that gives us a little bit of an insight. And, um, and the digging itself, it can take a bear some good hours, like around it day to, to dig a den and, and find herself comfortable in there. They must do adjustments throughout the time that are in den because they are much warmer than the outside temperature. So the den freezes in ice, so it seals them inside pretty well. So in order to breathe, they have to, throughout the time they're in the den, dig out a little bit uh, and make some nice air holes. But some bears actually change their uh, den sites. So I've seen on the data that I was working with that some bears went to a, a certain spot and you can see that they have been digging a den and they've been working hard. They stay there for a few days and then after some time, they just decided to move to another better place and dig another den there. So it takes some, some time for a bear to dig a den, but they also, it seems that it takes some time deciding where the right spot is. Um, so it, it seems that there's more into making it and then just digging a hole in the snow. All right. Well, I've got Hilda and Sinova back on satellite phone. Uh, I'm going to give them a minute to kind of give us a last word here, but I do want to just say, uh, Joanna and BJ, this has been so much fun. Thank you for uh, sharing the work you're doing, those great images. Uh, and the video clips. I was pretty distracted by that one polar bear just kind of rolling in the snow, having a good time. Uh, that was really cool to see. So thank you so much for sharing all that great 
uh, uh, research and, and kind of images with us. But I'm going to throw Thanks things for ahead. having us for sure today. Uh, and also uh, looking forward to your chat with Jan Arsh next week. Yeah, that should be great. We have another chat coming up. Uh, you've heard Jan Arsh's name come up a few times during today's event, and he's going to join us on the 15th uh at 12 p.m eastern in fact i'm going to share this little link here uh if you head over to the exploring by the seat uh website uh backslash polar bears uh you'll see where you can kind of register uh to join in that event and i also want to make sure i share this link to head over to polar bears international there is so much great uh curriculum there and clips and you can meet more of the team uh opportunities to get out on those live casts that uh bj is a part of uh, and obviously Joanna as well with scientists around the world. So definitely check out Polar Bears International as well. And I want to throw things to Hilda and Sonova. We'd love to get kind of a, a last word from Bum Yeah, thank you, Joe. It's, uh, it's fantastic to, um, to be a part of all this. And for us, it's a big privilege to be so close to, to the polar bears in their real life. And, um, uh, how we see them are living outside here, how vulnerable they are, though they are so big and and for us they're kind of frightening because they're life-threatening to us if we come in their way, but to stay on the distance and see how they're living and also to see how they're struggling. It's, it's uh, both uh, a beauty and also a sort of a, uh, yeah, a sad situation to see how, how they are, um, the, li the, the ice is lacking and uh, so we're just uh, we just need to do, all of us, try to do whatever we can to be helpful users and um, stay curious, stay involved, be, uh, maybe join some citizen science program or uh, whatever we all can do in our daily lives. And Sunala um, has some, some words to say too. Hey, Joe and everybody on the call. I, we, we don't know where all of you are from except the schools that joined, but there were quite a few people on uh, YouTube live too. So thanks for helping us build community around something super, super important. And as, um, you know, the days are growing shorter and we're all sort of in a form of hibernation right now. And we just want to encourage everybody out there to take care of each other. Um, we need to take care of the animals, but we need to take care of ourselves first. So please, each and every one of you do that. Maybe reach out to someone who needs a little more extra care. And we'd like your wishes. Um, we have an email, which is heartsintheice at gmail.com. And we want to take wishes that people have out there for yourself, your family, for the polar bears, for other animals. And then we'll post those on social media throughout the coming months. So um, take care of each other. And so much to PBI, Canada Goose, Joe, and everybody for making making this happen today. You guys are all really experts in your field. And we're proud to be aligned with all of you. So thanks, everybody. And have a good rest of your day. All right. Well, a huge shout out to that YouTube crew we had today from across North America and beyond. Thank you for those great questions. A shout out to our camera classes. Uh, you guys were awesome. Uh, and right back at Polar Bear International again, BJ, Joanna, uh, KT running things behind the scenes and Elisa sneaking in with uh, a little trivia knowledge there. Thank you so much uh, for just a phenomenal event today, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Thanks a lot. It. All right. We are going to sign